Hey class, and welcome to uh, your lecture for chapter 12, which is about adolescence to the end of life. This is the obviously the second phase of human development, and we're going to talk a little bit about what these things look like and what's going on physiologically um, and all that stuff. So here we go. Okay, so um, first of all, time to think about just what adolescence means. Um, there's, I'm sure, as you can all remember, um, being in adolescence, I think we even have some high schoolers taking this class right now that are maybe still in this phase of life. Um, but there's a lot of physical and emotional changes that are happening when you're an adolescent. Um, and there are uh, a lot of cultures um, in which adolescence is considered uh, to not be much of a big deal other than a rapid physical escalation to sexual immaturity. Um, in the United States, though, there is kind of a prolonged period of time that we consider adolescence. Our society doesn't really have any sort of rites of passage, which is uh, unique. A lot of different cultures and societies will have some kind of rite of passage. Ours really are, you know, graduating from high school is a big one, um, turning 21, being able to drink, being able to vote, those kinds of things. Um, so that's just something to think about. So what we're talking about right now with adolescence is sort of a Western model of adolescence. This isn't true across the globe of what this looks like, but the physical development does span cross-culturally. So uh, puberty is uh, approximately a two-year period of rapid physical changes that occurs sometimes between age, ages 7 and 16 in our society and culminates in sexual maturity. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, usually in girls, this can occur sometime between ages 7 and 14, average age is around 10, with boys uh, typically entering puberty two years later than girls at about age 12, a normal range of 9 to 16. Okay, uh, and here we go, just a definition of adolescence here. A period of transition from childhood to adulthood beginning around puberty and extending to adulthood typically the teenage years from 13 to 20 years of age. And because there's so much physical, so many physical changes happening in adolescence, there is what we call an adolescent growth spurt. And this is a period of accelerated growth that usually occurs within about two years after the onset of puberty. Sexual maturity is considered reached soon after the growth spurt ends. So let's talk a little bit about what exactly is taking place in all of this physical development and all of these physical changes. One really important factor is a genetically determined timetable that causes the pituitary gland to release growth hormone that triggers the rapid growth that takes place at the start of adolescence. Okay. The hypothalamus also increases production of chemicals that simulate the pituitary to release large, larger amounts of gonadotropins, and these are hormones that stimulate production of testosterone in men and estrogen in women. The resulting developments, breasts, deepened voice, and facial, body, and pubic hair are called secondary sex characteristics. The timetable that governs these processes may also be influenced by environmental factors as well as by an individual's health. So the rates of growth and development vary throughout the world in different societies, and the most likely cause of variation is due to the improved standard of living in societies. Oops. Okay, so effects of early and late maturation. So being the first or last to go through puberty can impact one's psychosocial adjustment. Early maturation for boys seems to hold an advantage. 
Uh, boys that go through early maturation are more poised, easygoing, and good-natured. Uh, they are more likely to be school leaders, better at sports, more popular, and more academically successful. This shortens the transition time from childhood and higher expectations to be more mature, bound by rules and routines. So that's boys who are going through early maturation. Late maturation for boys, these guys are more likely to be inappropriately aggressive and rebellious against authority, lack of self-confidence, feel inadequate and insecure. And the other thing that's interesting is boys that go through a later maturation tend to be more flexible during their youth and more insightful, independent, and less bound to conventional lifestyles. That trait that can carry through the rest of their lives as well just as boys that go through early maturation tend to be the opposite, pretty conformed to routine and rules. So there's some pluses and minuses there on both sides. For girls, early maturation appears to hold a disadvantage. Girls who go through early maturation tend to be bigger than all of the boys their age, which obviously could contribute some insecurity. They look more grown up than most of the girls their age. They may feel conspicuous, like they stick out. Um, they are at greater risk for a variety of behavioral problems, including smoking, risky sexual behaviors, alcohol and drug use, delinquency, and a sedentary lifestyle. Okay, let's talk a little bit now about cognitive development during adolescence. So we're skipping ahead a little bit here in that we didn't go through a discussion of the earlier stage of human development. Um, if you're interested in that, then I would suggest that you sign up for a human development course. Um, I know that those are offered and that'll go more in depth into different theories of human development. So right now, we're gonna talk a little bit about Piaget and his formal operational stage. So the formal operational stage is entered around 10, 12, excuse me, 12 years of age. It's marked by the emergence of the capacity to manipulate representations of objects, even when they are not physically present, able to engage in deductive reasoning, understanding of advanced subjects such as mathematics and physics, thinking more logically and abstractly, they question others, question their own judgments, and this may result in some confusion. And as they grow older, idealism may be replaced by a more pragmatic or practical view. Okay, we're really going to focus, though, on Kohlberg's theory of moral development. So Kohlberg was more interested in the ways in which thinking about right and wrong changed with age, than the specific things that children might consider right or wrong. So thinking more sort of abstractly about just the thinking about it that goes on versus the actual right or wrong of a situation, if that makes sense. So Kohlberg devised a series of moral dilemmas. Heinz's dilemma is an example. I'm going to read that to you right now. Here's Heinz's dilemma. So in Europe, a woman was near death from a special kind of cancer. There was one drug that the doctors thought might save her. It was a form of radium that a druggist in the same town had recently discovered. The drug was expensive to make, but the druggist was charging 10 times what the drug cost him to make. He paid $200 for the radium and charged 2000 for a small dose of the drug. The sick woman's husband, Heinz, went to everyone he knew to borrow the money, but he could only get $1,000, which is half of what it would cost. He told the druggist that his wife was dying and asked him to sell it cheaper or let him pay later. But the druggist said, no, I discovered the drug and I'm going to make money from it. So Heinz got desperate and broke into the man's store to steal the drug for his wife. So that's a, an example of a moral dilemma used by Kohlberg, and he was more interested in the process a person would use to reach their judgment rather than their judgment. 
uh, and their reasoning would indicate how their moral thinking advanced. So Kohlberg would ask his subjects a series of questions about each moral dilemma and then use a complex scoring system to assign a subject to a particular category or stage of moral reasoning. This approach led him to formulate a theory of moral development in which he proposed that we move through as many as six stages of moral reasoning that traverse three basic levels, pre-conventional, conventional, and post-conventional. Okay. So let's talk a little bit more in depth about what each one of these is. So pre-conventional morality, this is the lowest level of moral development in Kohlberg's theory and consists of stage one and stage two in which individuals have not internalized a personal code of morality. The next is conventional morality. This is the second level uh, of moral development and it consists of stages three and four when the motiv motivating force for moral behavior is the desire to help others or to gain approval. Finally, there's post-conventional morality, and this is the third and highest level, and this is where individuals are guided by values agreed upon by society or by universal ethical principles. So stage six is universal ethical principles. So let's look at some of these. So here we have table 12.1. This is on page 486 and 487 of your textbook. So stage one, um, in pre-conventional morality. Here we are, level one, stage one. Punishment and obedience orientation. The consequences of acts determines if they are good or bad. Okay. Stage two, instrumental orientation. An act is moral if it satisfies one's needs. So looking at stage one and going back to our Heinz dilemma, he should steal, this was what it would look like. He should steal the drug because he offered to pay for it and because it's only worth $200 and not the $2,000 the druggist was charging. Or he should steal it because if he lets his wife die, he would get in trouble. Okay, that's in favor of Heinz's theory. Opposing Heinz would be he shouldn't steal the drug because it is a big crime. He shouldn't steal the drug because he would get caught and sent to jail. So you can see that both of these are motivated by external forces, okay? And then now we're going to talk about stage two. So it's all right to steal the drug because his wife needs it to live and he needs her companionship. So that's meeting his own needs, okay? He should steal the drug because his wife needs it and he, and he isn't doing any harm to the druggist because he can pay him back later, okay? That's fitting his needs. So opposing, he shouldn't steal the drug because he might get caught and his wife would probably die before he gets out of prison, so it wouldn't do much. He shouldn't steal the drug, shouldn't steal it because the druggist was not doing a bad thing by wanting to make a profit. Okay, so you can see for and opposing in this one, both of these things are meeting one's own needs, okay? So level two is conventional morality. So stage three of this is good person orientation. An action is moral if it pleases or helps others and leads to approval. So in favor of Heinz, he should steal the drug because society expects a loving husband to help his wife regardless of the consequences, okay? So that's um, moral and expected and it leads to approval. He should steal the drug because if he didn't, his family and others would think he was an inhuman, uncaring husband. Clearly for approval. Okay, opposing Heinz's theory. He shouldn't steal the drug because he will bring dishonor on his family and they will be ashamed of him. Or he shouldn't steal the drug because no one would blame him for doing everything that he could legally. The druggist, and not Heinz, will be considered to be the heartless one. So you can see in this table that it doesn't matter if you're for Heinz or against Heinz, okay? It's the process that you use to reason that, that Kohlberg was interested in, and that's how he created these tiers of morality. Stage four, maintaining the social order orientation. Moral people are those who do their duty in order to maintain the social order. So he should steal the drug because if he did nothing, he would be responsible for his wife's death. He should take it back with the idea of paying the druggist back. 
Or he should steal the drug because if people like the druggist are allowed to get away with being greedy and selfish, society would eventually break down. Okay, so very much focused on society, okay? Against, he should not steal the drug because if people are allowed to take the law into their own hands, regardless of how justified such an act might be, the social order would soon break down. Or he shouldn't steal the drug because it's still always wrong to steal and his breaking the law would cause him to feel guilty. And then level three, post-conventional morality. So these are, we're getting here into where Kohlberg suggested was sort of the top tier of moral understanding. So level, stage five is social contract and individual rights orientation. A moral person carefully weighs individual rights against society's needs for consensus rules. So to in favor of Heinz, the theft is justified because the law is not set up to deal with circumstances in which obeying it would cost a human life. Or it is not reasonable to say that stealing is wrong because the law should not allow the druggist to deny someone access to a life-saving treatment. In this case, it is more reasonable for him to steal the drug than to obey the law. Or you could not really blame him for stealing the drug, but even such extreme circumstances do not justify a person taking the law into his own hands. The ends do not always justify the means. He shouldn't steal the drug because eventually he would pay the price of loss of self-respect for disregarding society's rules. And then stage six, this is what he considered to be the highest, okay? Universal ethical principles orientation. So the ultimate judge of what is moral is a person's own conscious operating in accordance with certain universal principles. Society's rules are arbitrary and they may be broken when they conflict with universal moral principles. So he must steal the drug because when a choice must be made between disobeying a law and saving a life, one must act in accordance with the higher principle of preserving and respecting life. Also, Heinz is justified in stealing the drug because if he had failed to act in this fashion to save his wife, he would not have lived up to his own standards of conscience. Against Heinz, Heinz must consider the other people who need the drug just as much as his wife. By stealing the drug, he would be acting in accordance with his own particular feelings with utter disregard for the value of all the lives involved. Or he should not steal the drug because, though he would probably not be blamed by others, he would have to deal with his own self-condemnation because he did not live up to his own conscience and standards. Okay? So this one's really internal. So think about, you know, when we were looking at the first one, stage one, it was all external motivation. Now it's become, in the highest level, stage six, all internally motivated. So some critics argue that a high level of moral reasoning does not necessarily go hand in hand with moral actions, especially if a person is under strong social pressure. Some argue that post-conventional morality is somehow preferable to conventional morality. Some people never reach stages five or six. And actually, Kohlberg maintained that only about 25% of adults in our society progress beyond stage four, and that most of these individuals do sometime during their adult years. And then even if people were able to get to stage six, what are the consequences in our society? Some also argue that morality plays a relatively minor role in the judgments and decisions people make every day. So some of these arguments you might find pretty valid. Um, what if, in, as Kohlberg suggests, if stage six is sort of the highest level of moral reasoning, what if everybody sort of took their own moral code and believed that that was higher than the law? Like, what would that look like? Um, so those are good things to think about. Okay, so let's talk about psychological development during adolescence. So a big part of psychological development during adolescence is about identity formation. Who am I? Where am I headed? Experimentation of various roles to forge a functional and comfortable sense of self. And society has greatly complicated the task of achieving a sense of identity. And some adolescents continue to struggle with their identity crises well into their college years. So the role of parents and the peer group. This, For those of you who have adolescents, you'll probably really be able to uh, relate to this. So 
The popular image of the teenage years as a time of rebellion and intergenerational warfare is more myth than fact. However, because adolescence is a time to become a separate, unique individual, it is a natural part of the transition from child to adult to have some strife with parents and sort of fight for that independence. This doesn't mean that they don't still really need support as well as independence from their family. So it's a balancing act, letting your adolescent sort of form their, their own identity and become the person that they're going to be, while also supporting them and maintaining some boundaries. Okay, um, also in adolescence, friendships become very close and are much more intense. And adolescents really identify with their peers and share intimate information with their friends, conforming to the standards of the peer group in hopes of gaining approval is a huge part of this. Part of why this is happening is young people probably find it reassuring to be with friends who are experiencing the same kind of awkward physical changes, having friends um, to go to for advice allows teenagers to get support and counsel without short-circuiting their independence from their parents. And the peer group also provides a sounding board for trying out new ideas and behaviors. And finally, it's comforting for teenagers to feel as they belong, as to feel they belong to a world of their own rather than being minor players in the adult world. Okay, sexual development during adolescence, um, sexual development and behavior. So really important to realize that there's a double standard here between males and females. So for males, the focus of sexuality may be sexual conquest to the point that young men who are not exploit exploitive or are inexperienced may be labeled with highly negative terms like sissy. For females, the message and the expectations are often very different. Many girls learn to appear sexy to attract males, yet they often experience ambivalence about overt sexual behaviors. If they do not have sexual relations, they worry that a boyfriend will lose interest. On the other hand, having sex might make a boy think they are too easy. So despite this double standard, contemporary adolescents are as likely to engage in sexual behavior with ca casual friends or acquaintances as with someone to which they feel emotionally attached. A significant number of adolescents experience premarital sex by the age of 15. The results of numerous nationwide surveys of adolescent sexual behaviors reveal a strong upward trend beginning in the 1950s through the 80s, a de decreasing trend through the 90s and a steady trend of about 50% being sexually active from 2000 to 2009. Sexual surveys conducted annually at the Authors Institution between 1989 and 2009 show a much higher rate with about 80% of students becoming sexually active by age 19. And there is accumulating evidence that young adolescents under age 15 are engaging in intercourse and other sexual activities in increasing proportions. So that's just some interesting information about what's happening in that part of the adolescent development. And also important to realize that a lot of this has to do with peer pressure. Um, again, wanting to fit in with that peer group, wanting to have approval, wanting to have that independence and sort of establish themselves as adults can make adolescents want to jump into some of that adult behavior. And some of that can also include drinking and smoking and those types of things that can make them feel that they appear more mature and more adult. So here is table 12-2. Um, and this is sort of, these are the statistics that we just went over. This is on page 491 of your textbook. Okay, so now let's talk about adulthood. That's the next phase after adolescence. And adulthood is divided into three periods. There's early adulthood, which is roughly age 20 to 40. Middle adulthood, 
40 to 65, late adulthood after 65. And while these categories can be helpful, they do run the risk of promoting age-related expectancies, which are not true. And many age-related expectations have begun to be broken. For instance, having people who have retired from one career going back to college and taking college classes. Um, I think that we have a really different outlook on age than we used to. And we are definitely moving toward an age-irrelevant society. Physical development that's going on in early and middle adulthood. As far as physical capacities, we reach the peak of our reproductive capacities and enjoy the best health of any time of our lives. Simple reflex time remains relatively constant from age 20 to 80, though. That's like when a doctor hits your knee and your knee has a reflex. Uh, vision and hearing are at their best at around age 20. Sensitivity to taste and smell decline with age. Sweet and salty tastes decrease most rapidly, while the tastes of bitter and sour are actually heightened. And physical strength declines 10% between ages 30 and 60. There's also some hormonal changes that are happening at this uh, stage of development. So the term climacteric uh, describes the physiological changes, including menopause, that occur during a woman's transition from fertility to infertility. Uh, it takes place, menopause is the cessation of menstruation that takes place during the climacteric. This occurs any time between 40 to 60 years of age and most commonly between 45 and 50. Um, men don't undergo the same hormonal changes, obviously, but they are also going through some things. Um, men experience an andropause. This is a condition of low testosterone, often attributed to the natural loss of testosterone pr production in older men also referred to as male menopause. Uh, male testosterone levels peak between the ages of 17 and 20. Um, let's go back here too and just hit on um, here, we're just going to touch on the fact that with aging and development in this stage of life, there's also a double standard here. Um, a woman's um, sort of generally considered past her sexual prime relatively early in the aging process. Um, and our society puts a lot of uh, in, intention, a lot of attention on younger standards of beauty. When you think of models and actresses, um, what it is to be beautiful, I think that there's definitely an expectation that there's youth involved there. So this contributes to, um, as a woman grows away from the image of youth, um, she's usually considered less attractive. And that's when cosmetics, Botox injections, and plastic surgery can be used to maintain a youthful appearance. Now the double standard comes in because, in contrast, men's physical and sexual attractiveness is often considered to be enhanced by age. Um, gray hair and wrinkles can be thought to look distinguished. Um, there's also a real connection between a man's attractiveness and his stature in life and his income. Both of those things increase for everyone with age. Um, so. That's a, a good thing to keep in mind as we're talking about this development and the double standards that exist in our society around aging. So cognitive development in early and middle adulthood, uh, we have two kinds of intelligence here we're gonna talk about. First one is crystallized intelligence. This is intelligence that results from accumulated knowledge, including knowledge of how to reason, language skills, and understanding technology. Uh, crystallized intelligence is measured by tests of general information, and research indicates that crystallized intelligence increases with age, which makes sense, 
because you're going to continue to learn and hone your skills. Um, fluid intelligence is the ability to perceive and draw inferences about relationships among patterns of stimuli, to conceptualize abstract information, and to solve problems. This type of intelligence peaks uh, between ages 20 and 30 and declines steadily thereafter. Okay, psychosocial development in early and middle adulthood. So increasing numbers of young and middle-aged adults in our society live alone, many out of choice. This is most pronounced among people in their 20s and 30s. Young adults who are married has decreased from 80% in 1965 to about 50% in 2010. And there are less people who are getting married or remarried for convention's sake. This is in part due to career choices marrying at a later age, more cohabitating couples, high divorce rates, and less dependence on marriage for women to ensure economic stability. Here's um, a graph of marriage rates. This is on page 496 in your textbook. And you can definitely see the intense decline here. So very interesting. Okay, the term cohabitate means living together in a sexual relationship without being married. Um, this is a trend that seems to definitely be increasing. Uh, between 1974 and 2010, cohabitation increased from 10% to 57%. Partly because there's a big paradigm shift that's happened um, where marriage is not the only lifestyle that legitimizes sexual relations any longer. However, marriage has not permanently gone away, obviously. Uh, marriage serves personal and social functions, provides societies with stable family units that help to perpetuate social norms, structures an economic partnership, a family unit, regulates sexual behavior, and provides a framework for fulfilling people's needs for social and emotional support. So you can see here um, rates of marriages and divorces. Um, you can also definitely track here a steady sort of uh, increase in divorce and decrease in marriage, right? So um, these, well, not, I guess not an increase in divorce, but a decrease in marriage and a steady hold here at about half. So it's, it is true that um, statistically speaking, one out of two marriages end in divorce. Okay, so the graying of America. So, interesting to keep in mind that in 1900, life expectancy was less than 50 years of age, and by 2000, it had increased to approximately age 77. That's a pretty big jump. The proportion of American people 65 and older has grown at twice the rate of the rest of the population. By the year 2020, it is estimated that more than 16% of the American population will be 65 and older. This is attributed to better medicine and medical procedures, as well as technological advances. So here is a graph that shows older population by age group, 1900 to 2050. So percent over 60 is in blue, percent over 65 is red, and percent over 85 is green. And you can see all of these just on the steady incline here. Okay, so physical development in older years. There are sharp declines in vision. I'm sure none of this is surprising for anyone. More farsightedness, trouble perceiving color and depth and adapting to changes in lighting. Hearing loss is common in addition to reductions in taste and smell sensitivity. And organ reserve. This is the potential ability of organs such as the heart, lungs, and kidneys to increase their output to a level several times greater than normal under emergency conditions. So basically just saying that under emergency conditions, your, your organs 
don't have the same potential to sort of kick into higher gear as, as the older years come on. Cognitive development in the older years. Uh, we're going to talk here a little bit about senile dementia. Uh, this is a collective term describing a variety of conditions sometimes associated with aging, including memory deficits, forgetfulness, disorientation for time and place, declining ability to think, and so forth. Um, one of these, one of the forms of senile dementia is Alzheimer's disease. This is an incurable disease that destroys neural tissue, resulting in an impaired capacity to remember, think, relate to others, and care for oneself. This is expected, rates of this are expected to increase as baby boomers age. 5% of those between ages 65 and 74 have AD. And the rate of risk of this increases to 50% for persons over 85. I'm sorry, not the rate of risk, the rate of people over 85 who have this increases to 50% over 85. Um, there's quite a lot of research going on um, currently to try to figure out um, how to cure Alzheimer's or prevent it. Um, right now, Alzheimer's disease alone accounts for 60% of all cases of senile dementia in people over 65. Um, they have found out that victims of this disease produce an abnormal protein called beta amyloid protein, and this deposits amyloid plaques in the brain. These proteins duplicate themselves to such an extensive extent in people with Alzheimer's disease that they create tangled webs, and these produce massive neurological damage and ultimately choke the life out of the affected cells. So that's sort of the, what the evidence is showing now, and a lot of research is going into how to change that. Right now, it's incurable. Okay, so cycle of C. The older years do tend to be golden for most. It is a time of continued independence and freedom from the burdens of job and family obligations. Um, there are ways to make this more successful by having a social support, an environment in which a person has close relatives or personal friends. Um, social isolation tends to be a bad idea for uh, elderly adults. This is an environment lacking social interaction, such as one in which an elderly person lives alone, can have detrimental effects on one's health and recovery, and less buffers from the harmful, harmful effects of stress. Okay, so that is our lecture for this week. Um, I hope you found some useful information there. And um, don't forget to do your discussion post. And I hope you all have a really great week.